Thank you, Julie. It's really a pleasure to be back with my Jewish learning. Um, there's not much that's great about the pandemic, but one good thing has been uh, meeting Julie, uh, getting to know my Jewish learning, doing some classes, and now embarking on this first of six sessions about Judaic art. So when Julie and I were talking about um, what the classes might look like, we were uh, running through some ideas, and I, I really feel that this year has been about sharing um, everything that I, I know. Not only am I turning 60 and starting to feel like it's time for the next generation to do more uh, of the art, but I'm also feeling like um, I want to just share everything I know. And there's so many people who are interested in all the different kinds of arts and techniques that I use and have used for 36 years as a Judaic artist. So this is about sharing everything. I want to just make sure that you know that at any point, if you have questions, type them into the chat. Um, you can also reach me on my website that Julie's going to put on the uh, chat, kuvanoran.com. And I'm very open to answering any questions. I really think that um, I, was, I was given the gift of mentors uh, when I was a young, uh, up, up and coming uh, Judaic artist. And I want other people to have that same feeling that they can reach out and ask questions. And the only way we can help each other is um, by asking questions and sharing our knowledge. Um, the first thing is I just love, love, love being a Judaic artist. Everything about it inspires me. And as we go through um, a slideshow that I'm gonna to present to you, I'll talk about the business of being an artist, about what it's like to work with committees, um, about all the different media uh, that I work with. And then as we go through the different sessions, we will focus on each of um, the different items and we'll talk more about the schedule in a minute. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, give me a second here. Okay, hopefully this works correctly. Um, okay. Looks great, Jeanette. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So we're journeying into Judaic art. I grew up in Florida, in Palm Beach, Florida, and we grew up in Palm Beach when there were no Jewish families here, very, very few. Um, my father was the local doctor and my parents were very proud of being Jewish, but there weren't a lot of other Jewish families to hang out with they became very, very much in love with Israel. And their antidote to our not having a lot of Jewish friends was we lived in Jerusalem every summer, starting in 1972. So at my bat mitzvah in 1974 at a reform synagogue, which is still there, Har El Synagogue, my mom, who loved to needlepoint, um, said, Jeanette, will you draw a canvas and we'll give a Torah cover to, to Har El Synagogue? So this is me at my bat mitzvah holding the Torah in Jerusalem. Um, and this is my first Torah cover. Honestly, I have to tell you that it wasn't until about uh, 10 years ago that I came across this picture and remembered that we had made the Torah cover together. It didn't even occur to me then that I was thinking of, of being a Judaic artist, but clearly it was in, in <laughs> deep within me that I wanted to do this when I was 13 years old. Um, so after uh, I made the uh, Torah cover, let me just, there we go. Um, now you fast forward 10 years and I'm getting married to um, my husband, Dan. Um, and, and I referred back to mentors before. I, I was very um, impacted by both Hillel rabbis, uh, first undergrad, Rabbi Eddie Feld, and then in graduate school, Rabbi Jim Ponet. Both were very, very encouraging of my delving into my uh, Jewish knowledge and love of Judaism. And Rabbi Ponet said, uh, you and Dan are getting married, why don't you make a ketubah? I had to look up what is a ketubah. I went to the Jewish catalog and I, I read the chapter by my now good friend, David Moss, on how to make your own ketubah. 
And then I read the chapter by Jay Greenspan of Blessed Memory, who wrote a chapter on Hebrew calligraphy. And that led me to creating my own ketubah, which you can see behind the rabbi there. And that was the first Judaic art I had made uh, uh, in that time of my life. And then people started asking me to make their ketubot. So at that time, I was getting my PhD in epidemiology, as Julie said, at Yale. Um, I called my parents and I said, uh, people are starting to pay me to make their kitu vote. Um, I think I'm going to just quit the PhD and become an artist. And uh, to my parents' credit, um, they said, uh, could you support yourself? And to my naive uh, <laughs> self, I said, of course I could. Um, but I, I never looked back. And uh, even though I was about 80% done with the whole dissertation, with everything, I have loved uh, doing what I'm doing. This year has made me a little bit envious of epidemiologists, but um, I, I really do love being an artist. So I began by making ketubot for other couples. And let me just show you a few examples of those. So when a couple comes and they ask about uh, getting a ketubah, which is a Jewish marriage contract made, um, there are many things you need to discuss and everything I make is is one-on-one -on -one with the marrying couple. So first we discuss what text do they want. Um, and then we discuss what colors, what shapes, what themes, everything is custom made with the couple that's getting married. So in this example, um, this is Rabbi uh, Susan Silverman, who um, is very active in Jerusalem uh, community affairs now. She's married to Yossi Abramowitz. Susan is and was a reform rabbi. Yossi was Orthodox. So their ketubah is a combination of a reform English text and a traditional Aramaic text. And they knew that one day they would live in Jerusalem. So this is a map that I found, an antique map of Jerusalem that I painted. Um, and they, they knew they wanted a big family. So they asked me to paint five children in the design that's going around with all the holidays being celebrated. So interestingly, this is their family now. And this, um, every year they take a picture of their family with their ketubah to show their family progress. So it's beautiful. They live in Baca in Jerusalem now. I stay in touch with them. So every ketubah, as I said, is made with the couple. On the left, you see um, a paper cut border to the English and the Aramaic text. Anila Dodi Vidodi Lee at the top. And that means I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. And then this couple happened to like pear trees. So there's a, there are pear trees going around, floral um, flowers from their wedding, the colors that they love. And behind the paper cut is dyed silk. Uh, I'll talk more about um, the fabric in a few minutes. And on the right, this couple wanted a very traditional text, which is uh, in Aramaic on parchment and the design is a more uh, Persian style painting done with gouache. Here you see a paper cut um, that is backed with dyed silk and this couple, which you can see on the left, um, got married at a lighthouse. They're from New York and from Washington and then their family trees are at the bottom of their ketubah and then in the paper cut there are personal symbols about their lives together. And then I have used, in addition to just paper cutting and painting, I like to mix different media. So this is fabric mixed with calligraphy. I um, make basically a quilt, a small quilt. And then as you can see, I cut out the hole where the text will go on paper and I finish the fabric so that it frames the calligraphy. And then um, sometimes I make other cutouts and add paper cutting behind the fabric. It's just a way of getting more texture, more interest, more color into the ketubah. One couple um, asked me to make their ketubah look like a talit. So uh, this is um, all different white on whites um, with quilting for detail. And it's a long uh, vertical shape. And then you see the tzitzit tied in the four corners. Uh, very different. Um, here's a detail of it. 
Um, uh, and I, I just love trying new things, mixing different fabrics, mixing techniques, adding different textures. Um, this is a detail of, of one of my first Kutu boat, and I love it because it's the Brooklyn Bridge. And then in paper cutting, um, it's a piece of music that the bride and the groom wanted. So uh, you can do a lot with a paper cut. I've taught a paper cl cut class here. If you go to my website, you'll see a little video on how to do paper cutting. Um, it's not hard, but when you do tiny little paper cuts with notes, it just takes a, lo a little bit of time, a little delicate. So this couple was getting married um, in my home synagogue in Connecticut, actually. And this is the stained glass behind the bima. And they wanted that featured in their ketubah, which you see on the right. So it's a combination of a paper cut uh, with behind it a watercolor painting of the stained glass. So when they look at their ketubah, they're reminded of their wedding. I just want to remind everybody that on May 11th, I'll be doing a class just on the ketubah. So we'll be delving into the history of the ketubah, the marriage contract, different techniques for making a ketubah, and I will be talking about how you can make your own ketubah using different technologies today that have made it more easy than ever before. So uh, watch my Jewish learning for that. So, as I was making Ketubot, and I read again the Jewish catalog on how to do Hebrew calligraphy, I, we were about to move to Washington, and I, I found in a calendar, I think it was a women's, Women of Reform Judaism calendar, um, a paper cut artist named Tamar Fishman. I called Tamar, and I said, I want to be your friend, I love your art, and we became very, very good friends. She inspired me to learn how to do paper cutting. Um, this is an example of a paper cut that was commissioned by a synagogue in honor of their anniversary. Um, so the paper cut is, is of the ark inside the synagogue, and then the children, um, other symbols about the synagogue, Beth L in West Hartford, Connecticut, and then um, prints of it were made to give to donors um, after. So uh, paper cuts can be made into prints, they're not three dimensional, but um, but it's a less expensive way of sharing a piece of art. This is an example of a design um, that this year, and I'll talk more about what's different about this year, but I've taken some of these designs I've made in the past and made them into templates. So anybody can do this design at home. So I took this template, which I made probably 25 years ago. It's um, Days of Creation. And um, I made it available as a download on my website. And we'll talk more about that later. But this is what it looks like when you're finished and if you were to put colorful silk behind it. Then this is an example of a paper cut uh, about the song Echad Mi Yodea from the Passover Seder. And I illustrated all the verses of the Seder. And so you see um, the Echad for God in the center. And who knows one? Who knows one, one is our God, one is our God that we sing at the Seder. Um, this is the original, the first time I made the paper cut. And now I've, I've made it into a template again so people can make it for themselves and make it at home. So we'll, I'll talk, tell you later about how to get that. This was commissioned by a synagogue whose rabbi was moving to another synagogue and this is a paper cut of his family. His three young children and his wife and all the different symbols of the, a year in the life of, of a rabbi or a Jewish family. Um, so this hangs in his office in his new congregation. And I love this picture because it shows a young boy who I made his parents ketubah about 20 something years ago. And then they called me when he became a bar mitzvah and I made his bar mitzvah invitation. So I love that um, I'm old enough now to have multi-generational <laughs> Judaic art going on. So now let's move to, so I'm, I'm going through how I went from media, one medium to another. As I was doing um, Ketubot, I started dyeing the fabric that would go behind the paper cutting. Then people would ask me, could I make a family tree as a paper cut or just a family tree with a different kind of a layout? So I then m moved into making family trees. 
This is a more recent family tree because now I'm using the computer more for layout. So as you can see here, I paint the background by hand and then over it using a computer and printing, I'm able to put many more generations on than I could have before and also photographs. So um, since my husband is very into genealogy, I've learned a lot about family trees and genealogists. It's really fun to make a beautiful family tree. Here's a, here's a little more detail of that family tree. And again, computer has been a huge help for the layout of a family tree. Now, I um, used to do it all by hand, all the calligraphy. And this is what it looks like up close when I'm doing the calligraphy by hand on a large family tree with watercolor uh, design around it. Here's a, the entire family tree. Eventually, um, working with the fabric that I dyed to go behind the paper cut led to making Torah covers. I always love to sew. Um, I was telling a friend that when I was nine years old, my mother signed me up for a singer sewing class at the mall. And it was the best gift she could have given me because one class and I have a lifetime of sewing. My friend Amanda Ford asked if we could make uh, the Torah covers for our synagogue at that time in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, Amanda's an amazing quilter. And the two of us got together and made and donated this set of Torah covers. We didn't know it would lead to anything. We just were giving a gift to our synagogue. This is the seven days of creation. Um, each, each one is made out of hand dyed silk and other fabrics. And each one is its own small quilt that is wrapped around a wooden mantle that I finish using upholstery type techniques. So we made these Torah covers in 1994. The photograph was used on the cover of the United Synagogue calendar that year. And that really launched um, what would become uh, the most popular thing I make, which is Torah covers and art curtains and all kinds of fiber art. So since 1994, this is um, the largest percentage of what I do is fiber art. And this is because of this calendar. Um, also because um, the calendar led to young rabbis seeing my art at the Jewish Theological Seminary, which led to their going out into the world and remembering what we had made for JTS. So I'll just take you through some of the examples of the Torah covers that I've made. Um, I've worked with more than 300 synagogues on Torah covers, and each synagogue is usually hiring me to make a set of Torah covers. This is probably the largest set that I made in its one continuous panorama in the Ark in West Hartford. And this is using the technique of paper cutting with fabric. Um, in the chuppah class, which is coming up in the spring, I will talk about how exactly I do this. Uh, it's the same technique for chuppot as it is for Torah covers. Um, basically, I'm using a fabric like ultra suede and that is appliqued or it's cut and by hand and then appliqued onto the hand dyed, in this case, a silk velvet that I dye. But each Torah cover, the design wraps around the entire Torah. So each one is its own complete little tree in this case. It, and this is the same technique. This is paper cut fabric on a background of metallic silk that's, that comes from India. Um, gives a little bit of sheen. And then the body of the Torah covers is quilted fabrics, in this case, all in white, because these, this is a high holiday set for Temple Israel in, in, in Michigan. It's divided across different, uh, the chapel, the different sanctuaries of this very large synagogue. Um, but you can see that they all kind of go together in one, in, in one set. Um, sometimes a synagogue will write a Torah or dedicate a Torah in honor of some, some uh, member. Um, so on the left, you see a, a Torah cover that was made after the synagogue wrote a Torah cover. That's a really fun experience for everybody in the congregation. Um, so that same synagogue that had me do all the high holiday Torah covers over time has added to their everyday Torah covers. They went from this set of three to this set of five, and I think now we're up to seven in one arc. So when they want a new one, I make one that matches. And again, the design goes all the way around each Torah cover. 
This was a very early set that I made. Um, and the way I can date it is because on the left, you see the Horva Synagogue Arch in Jerusalem. Today, that arch is now replaced by, the, by an entire building, a rebuilding of the Horva Synagogue. But this is different um, views of Jerusalem and more specifically in the old city in the Cardo. Um, again, Israel is one of my favorite inspirations uh, for my daughter's bat mitzvah, um, which was at Robinson's Arch. I made this Torah cover for the Masorti movement. Sadly, a few weeks later, the Torah and the cover were stolen. So this is just you know, one of the only pictures we have of this Torah cover and the Torah. Um, so I really like working um, a local, the flora, the fauna, the feeling, the philosophy of each locale into the Judaic art. As, as I've traveled with my husband from genealogy in Europe back to my own family's roots in Germany or Czechoslovakia, um, I love that the themes of the art are very local. They come from the rituals, the customs of that locale. Um, and I love when a synagogue wants to reflect their own locale, as did Fire Island Synagogue here. This is their high holiday Torah covers. And this is like a scene on a beach at Fire Island. Um, this was really fun. And I, and I find it meaningful to work um, in that way, in, in, in reflecting the local uh, geography and landscape. Um, and then uh, another inspiration, of course, is the Torah. Um, so this synagogue in Des Moines wanted the seven days of creation. I've used the seven days of creation in many different um, projects. Uh, and you can see a little bit of an echo back to the first set that I made with Amanda. Um, but it's really, it's always fun to revisit all the different themes uh, from the Torah. This is, again, a panorama of a tree across four different Torahs, but it also has the sunset of Oakland, California behind it. And everything has to line up, which is a lot of fun to work on and takes a little bit of time in my studio, lining everything up perfectly. Um, and then some synagogues don't want any uh, literal motif. They want more of an abstract idea, like this synagogue in Dayton, um, where they all the synagogues are exhibited on different heights within the arc. And so working across a panorama was a little more complicated, but I, I love how it turned out, how it turned out. And then recently, um, just last year, I made this set of Torah covers for Central Synagogue in Manhattan. Um, very different look, very contemporary. This is for their high holidays, and it had to reflect this small arc of their transportable service. This is usually held at Lincoln Center, um, and they move the arc there. So these Torah covers have not been viewed yet because uh, they were just finished in uh, last August. But, um, but it's a new look, and I, I love working that way, um, new projects. I, I saw um, uh, some friends are here from Pittsburgh. I just want to talk about this project for a second. Um, I've worked with Tree of Life several times over the last few years. This set of Torah covers was the first set uh, they commissioned, and they have beautiful stained glass windows at Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. Gorgeous uh, stained glass. Stained glass looks wonderful when it's translated into dyed silk. So this is silk that I then paper cut in style, uh, black ultra suede, laid it over the silk, and then quilted everything. And that's how I made their set of Torah covers. Shortly after the shootings in 2018, um, a cantor named Stephen Stoyer contacted me. He is friends with Rabbi Myers at Tree of Life, and he and some friends were donating a Torah and Torah cover to Tree of Life. He didn't know that I had made the Torah covers for them originally. Um, but after I told him, he, we worked together on making the new Torah cover look like it went with the old Torah covers, but it would be very special and it would be dedicated in memory of the victims of the shooting. Um, so this is this Torah cover. Um, and it was made especially for Rosh Chodesh. That's when they use this Torah on Rosh Chodesh, the beginning of the new month. Uh, we recite the blessings 11 months of the year. There are 11 gold stars in the sky. 
one for each of the shooting victims of the people who were murdered at the synagogue. There are 36 total number of stars uh, for the Lamed Vavniks, the righteous people that we say about in our tradition. Um, the river represents uh, the comfort of the world that was extended toward Pittsburgh. And the stones represent when we go to a cemetery as a way to show honor to the deceased, we put a stone on a grave. And finally, um, the blessing we say in the Rosh Chodesh part of the service ends with the words um, Chaim and Litova for good. So in the word Litova, the Lamed rises up into a tree of life. And so this was, it, it was um, a wonderful design to work with Cantor Stoyer on. And now he has written a book about the Torah cover and the Torah cover right before the pandemic was traveling around the country as a part of way, a, a way synagogues could educate children about anti-Semitism. Hopefully that will continue again after the pandemic. And then finally, wrapping up Torah covers, I do a lot of Torah covers that go on Torahs that were rescued from the Shoah, from the Holocaust. Um, these are some examples of them. Um, and then uh, I've also done some displays of Holocaust Torahs. There's a synagogue in London called Westminster, which has a very, very large trove of Torah covers that were rescued and they're loaned out to synagogues around the world that give them a place of honor and educate their communities about the history of those Torahs. So um, I've worked with some synagogues on how you can educate the community about the community that the Torah covered, that, that the Torah came from. So this is one example. Now let me talk very quickly, and I'm sorry to race through it, but um, I want to talk about how I work with a, a community on a commissioned piece of art. Commissioning art is very different from creating art and, and then hoping that people purchase it. It's working with a community. It's, it's talking with a group. It's a little like group therapy because you have to get to yes together, but um, it's, it's very different than just creating it's getting everybody on board so the first thing is i do I, I do is i meet with a committee that represents a synagogue or community or family or a couple and we discuss the designs the themes the inspiration colors i present designs based on those conversations and then i tweak the designs over and over and over until everybody is happy and once they sign off on the designs and the fabrics then I make the art. So let me show you one example. This is in St. Louis, Congregation Shara MF um, was doing a renovation and they showed me a sketch of what their new sanctuary would look like, including um, this beautiful, beautiful new ark that I hadn't seen yet, but was going to be made out of glass. And the theme of that ark is let justice roll down as water and righteousness as a mighty stream from Amos. So we knew that the theme would be water rolling down, justice, and, um, and could I make Torah covers based on those themes. So I was in Israel at the time, and I knew that they had Jerusalem stone behind uh, their bima. So I used as inspiration these kinds of scenes from Ein Gedi um, and rolling water. How could I translate that into Torah covers? That was my... <laughs> uh, my job. And um, the first draft, I was, as I said, I was living in Jerusalem that year, um, it looked like this. And I thought it looked like rolling waters. And I thought, you know, it was going to, it was going to accomplish everything. Committee did not like this. So um, I was back to the drawing board. And this is normal. This is just a normal way that uh, you work on a commission. So I went back to the drawing board. And after a lot of back and forth, this is the painting of the final design. And this is how I do the math in my studio. Uh, so I have exactly where these tours are, are in the arc and how they're going to fit together. So we discussed all the details. I sent them fabric samples, and then I started to make the Torah covers. They had uh, not only the sanctuary, there were two other chapels that I was making Torah covers for at the same time, very different. Uh, interiors of those rooms and very different look and feel to each of the sets 
of Torah covers. So you hear, see here the chapel, um, and then they have a, a small, smaller arc, which they call the Kihila Center. Um, so this is the final designs that they signed off on. After that, I went to my studio and I dyed and painted all the silk and I used new techniques. So this idea of watercolor painting on the large stretch silk, this was the first time I had done that. Um, and it, it really worked because it really kind of felt like water. So then I take all that silk that I've dyed in for the many different projects and I start piecing, sewing, uh, pinning, um, getting it ready to uh, sew and to quilt. On large projects, usually art curtains, but some Torah covers, I work on my long arm quilting machine, which you see here. By the way, I have a, I have a video of my studio in action and uh, Julie will put it in the chat before we leave tonight. Uh, so you can watch that video at your leisure. It's just a five minute video. Um, so this is what the Torah covers looked like after they were quilted. Um, I actually made the Torah covers mostly on a sewing machine using free motion quilting. Um, and then I add the cord at the top. I line them with satin and I wrap them around a wooden mantle that, I've, that I cover with fabric, usually an ultra suede, which is a synthetic. This is the set that is in the sanctuary. And this is Jerusalem stone made of a silk velvet um, with the overlay of, of a, a bridal satin that's been hand dyed. And I really wanted, and I think it worked, um, to get the feeling of water running over the stone. And this is, you saw the sketches before. These are the finished Torah covers for the chapel and the Kihila Center. And then um, they also had High Holiday Torah covers for all those different sanctuaries. And this is what they look like for the High Holidays. So um, Rabbi Bennett invited me uh, right before the pandemic, so exactly a year ago, to come for a dedication of all three sets of Torah covers. And this is just a screenshot of the dedication. And you can see a little bit of that arc, which is magnificent, handmade glass, and the rolling down of the water inside the arc. So after I started making Torah covers, one thing led to another, and now we're making arc curtains. Arc curtains, of course, can be large, um, that they hang inside the arc uh, itself. They're not sometimes not so large. Sometimes they're translucent and sometimes they're opaque. Um, this is an example of an arc curtain in Coral Springs that is supposed is, is um, from a quote from Isaiah, arise, shine, for your light has come. And I also wanted it to convey the colors of Florida. So it's a sunburst over the Atlantic Ocean at the same time. It's all made of dyed silk that is then quilted. Um, more recently, um, an Orthodox synagogue in Manhattan, and I had never heard of this synagogue. It was built at this time of the Civil War and President Lincoln visited this synagogue. It's an amazing little historic gem near NYU. Um, they wanted uh, to convey their relationship and love of Israel. And they also wanted to match the stained glass that's in their historic building. So this was my um, answer to doing both stained glass and uh, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, which it says at the top. Uh, a more contemporary look um, that also had to match the stained glass in Temple Emmanuel's chapel. Um, and if you are standing in the chapel and you look to the right and the left, you'll see a continu continuation of this uh, stained glass shape in their chapel. And then something very different. In Las Vegas, they wanted a very, very large art curtain, but it was sheer and it was like a burning bush and you can see the Torahs through it. It's made out of sheer fabrics that are layered one on the other. Um, and then um, I've worked with synagogues all over the world because of the internet. I don't have to go, I wish I could, but I didn't go to Santiago, Chile. Um, but this is the parting of the Red Sea and then God leading the Israelites through, Egypt, uh, through the desert with columns of smoke and, and pillars of fire, um, which you see here, but the, also the pillars of fire form the letter Shin, 
which is a symbol uh, for God. So it's abstract and yet it also has a, a message. This is a very different technique for this um, uh, art curtain in uh, Baltimore. This is one piece of silk that I did a watercolor painting on, but I, I thickened the silk dyes with gelatin and then painted on the silk. And that way you can, then this, the dye doesn't spread and you can control it like as if you were painting on paper. And then I quilt it. This is a detail of it. Um, a really fun technique. I hope I get to use again soon. So this is what I mentioned before, the Jewish Theological Seminary hired um, Amanda and I at the time to make the art curtain in 1995 that's in the Women's League Sanctuary. It still is their art curtain and um, there's a detail of it. It says the bush was not consumed, which is the motto of the seminary. And um, it's just a great honor to be part of young rabbis as they as they study and they, they leave to have their own congregations. They remember this kind of art. Um, and also in New York, a large art curtain at Sutton Place Synagogue, the rabbi at the time, Rabbi Thaler, wanted to evoke Jerusalem. This is the Lion's Gate in Jerusalem. It's, it's, it's modeled after actually a photo that I took at the Lion's Gate, but in fanciful colors, of course. And when you open this curtain, um, you see this panorama of Jerusalem inside their arc. And then um, arc curtains and arc doors, um, I was led to work in metal. So I designed a paper cut, but this would be interpreted in, in aluminum. So now with technology, I can give a laser cut uh, company a design that's originally a paper cut made on the computer and they can cut it out of quarter inch aluminum. And in this case, these are doors to an arc in St. Louis. And when you open the arc, um, you have the brightly colored Torah, Torah covers that are seen through this uh, tree, this leafy tree. Um, and then I use a similar technique more recently at a synagogue in Brookline, Massachusetts, again, cut out of aluminum. And when you look through into the inside of the Aron, into the Ark, um, I worked with uh, David Ascalon. He fabricated a mosaic um, so it would uh, have this flowy, watery feeling inside the Ark. And you can see that through the, the, the paper cut style doors. And then wall hangings. I'll just briefly go through wall hangings. This was a very early wall hanging I made um, for the uh, kosher kitchen at the uh, Center for Jewish Life and hangs in their dining hall. It's all the different holidays being celebrated in the city of Jerusalem. And one of my favorite projects ever was for Agudath Shalom in Stanford. Um, the caretaker of the synagogue, Rosie, had been there for 40 something years. He started work at the same time that the rabbi had. And when he passed away, uh, the synagogue commissioned a wall hanging in his memory. So this wall hanging is 24 feet wide and six feet high. It, I had to make it in sections because it's so large. It's made out of hand dyed silk. And it's based on a story that at the beginning of time, God is giving us a tiny seed of light, and that seed is on the far right. But only through our good works, mitzvot, and at the time of redemption, will we see the entire light of God. And so we're only seeing a fraction of God's light right now. But if we work hard enough, eventually we will, we will see all of God's light. So that is what this wall hanging is about. And in the final light, you see a rose, and the rose symbolized not only Rosie, the caretaker, but it also symbolizes Israel. Uh, the rose can be a symbol for Jacob, which is a symbol for Israel. Um, these, were, these were a kind of different commission. Um, for a funeral home, you don't want to have too much imagery. You want things to be fairly neutral. So this funeral home commissioned wall hangings that would just evoke the outside in Connecticut. Um, so they're made with dyed silk and different overlays of metallic fabrics. And here, um, one of my, again, a favorite, they're all favorites. I love all of these projects. 
Um, this is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be happy in it. And this is a wall hanging with an open Torah with lots and lots of colors of um, dyed silk quilted. Um, this is the history of Jewish New Haven. We had only recently moved back to New Haven and I was commissioned to make a piece that would tell the story of the Jewish community of New Haven, which has a very rich history. Um, and so this hangs in the JCC. Every building on this uh, wall hanging is a real uh, place that exists or existed. Every business was owned by a Jewish family. It involved a year of research, um, but it was a great way to get to know our new community at the time. This is a detail of it. It's made all of, of different fabrics, little tiny paintings of each synagogue, each building. Um, and as people told me about their family businesses, I made them into a little miniature and it's, it hangs at the JCC. Um, so again, one thing leads to another. People were asking me to make their ketubot and then I started making chupot, the marriage canopies. This is a pandemic wedding uh, that was just a few months ago and very happy bride and groom, you can see. Uh, and there are many different techniques that I use to make chuppahs. This is a painted silk chuppah that I then quilted. We're gonna talk about chuppot in a very special session in the spring, um, so I'll just run through them pretty quickly. Uh, the same technique, dyed silk um, using a painting technique and then quilting it and making it as large as the bride or the couple would like it to be. Um, and then you can use uh, family photographs on fabric now. Really fun techniques. We're going to talk about how to do all of that in the Chopa class. And uh, this is my daughter's wedding. Uh, so this was a paper cut uh, Hoppa, first time I did this, made out of fabric. The, the technique is paper cutting, but it's all made out of fabric. So this has become the family heirloom uh, that all the nieces and nephews will hopefully use at their weddings. Uh, so this is a detail of it. So in April, if you're interested in how I make chupot, if you're interested in making a chupa, tune in. We'll go through all different ways to do that. So um, when a I always say when people ask me, like, um, what are some tips you would give to people who want to do art as a business uh, or a career? I say, never say no, always say yes. So when, a, when an organization or a synagogue or school says, will you, in the back of my mind, I always am ready to say yes, but I also have to say, how am I going to learn how to do that? So glass is an example of this. And so are metal and mosaics. So I put them together. Um, I design glass uh, arcs and the way the glass works is I design everything on the computer. These designs are printed onto film. This is very high tech now. And the film is permanently adhered onto the glass. This is a technique in, in 20 years ago, we would have done real etching, but you don't need to do etching anymore. So it's become a little less expensive uh, and a lot easier um, to design for glass. So this is an example in Morristown, New Jersey, of a glass design on an arc and the Torahs that you can see behind it. A different synagogue in Needham, Massachusetts, um, it looks like etching, but if you run your hand over it, it's completely smooth because it's film and it's made on the computer. Um, the story behind this arc is the doors are curved and the first time we did it, we did it with real etching. They're about 10 feet high and about five feet wide each door. The etching was done and within one minute, it explode, the doors exploded and were dust, sand on the floor of the um, glass guy. And they realized because of the curvature of the glass, it couldn't be etched. That's when we discovered this technique of using the film. And that has freed us up, uh, me and whatever architect I'm working with or interior designer, to use glass more often. Uh, so this was a wall hanging I made that was intentionally made to be photographed and made into glass. A synagogue in Medford, Massachusetts commissioned arc doors. This is a menorah, seven branch menorah. And then I photographed it, it's a wall hanging. I photographed it. These are the glass doors that were installed, replacing old brass doors. Um, and then the glass was then 
the film was put onto the glass. And this is, tra they're translucent. So this arc looks like this. And when the Torahs are inside the arc, you can see little, the outline of the Torahs behind the glass. And then I work with fabricators like Gary Rosenthal, who works with glass and metal. And this is a donor wall um, that we made uh, just last year for a synagogue in Newton, Massachusetts. And all the names of the donors are on the river of this donor wall. A, a different technique. I love the three dimensionality of it. And they wanted something that would take up most of the hallway, which, which this does. I love the detail that Gary put in to the art um, that we worked on together. You can see. Um, how intricate it is and how rich it is. And if you're walking in the hallway, how interesting it is to have that three-dimensional look. And then mosaics, I work with a fabricator named Stephen Miotto, who is the best, one of the best in the world. He comes from Italian family. If you go to the subways in New York, all the new ones are made by Stephen Miotto, the new mosaics. Um, I've been working with Stephen since 99, or even earlier actually. And this is a mosaic um, for the Charles E. Smith Jewish Day School to thank the donors. It's in the lobby of the lower school. And here's a detail, not a great picture, but you can see the intricacy of Stephen's uh, mosaics. We're going to do a mosaic class. I'll get to that in a second. And we're gonna visit Stephen's studio as he's working on a new project that I'm working with him on. This is a mosaic um, for a synagogue in Milwaukee. Um, it was a merger of two synagogues and they wanted to reflect their history in the lobby. And so one of the windows represents the past, um, the far past, the distant past. One represents their Milwaukee past, their old location in Milwaukee. And one represents their future, uh, the dancing children, Jerusalem. Um, and this is a large uh, mosaic that Stephen fabricated and then uh, installed in Milwaukee. So on July 12th, come back and we will visit Stephen's studio and you will see a master at work on a new project. This is a detail from a, uh, from a mosaic we did together in Coral Gables, Florida. Um, Needlepoint, it, it, it's just a funny thing how I got into needlepoint. You, you, knew, you saw the original Torah cover I made with my mom. Um, I don't needlepoint, uh, I knit, but I don't needlepoint, but I love to design for needlepoint. And I work with a company that license my, licenses my designs. So I both paint original canvases, like this set of Torah covers that was stitched by B'nai Israel in Rockville, Maryland. Um, and, then I, and then they were made into Torah covers. And I also um, take old designs I've used um, on other projects and um, license them to a needlepoint company. <clears throat> and so anybody can needlepoint them. This is an example of a Torah cover that I made recently. I designed for uh, Temple Bethel in Boca um, where a congregants needlepointed, did all the stitching. They did an amazing job. This is a detail of that. So we will be talking about needlepoint on June 10th. And if you are at all interested in Needlepoint, um, Doreen, the owner of artneedlepoint.com, will teach a beginning stitch and an advanced stitch. And we will go over a lot of the history of Needlepoint and um, some of how I design for Needlepoint. This is an up close of a chuppah that was uh, stitched um, by a young woman for her family chuppah. And then finally, I just want to talk for a minute about uh, the business of being an artist in the time of a pandemic. So we were all living, um, seven my, of us, my children, my grandchildren, we were all together for 10 weeks and my, I was bemoaning what's going to happen. I, I want to create, I want to work, I want to do my usual work, but I don't think synagogue art is going to be happening for a while. My daughters, who were in their 30s, said, Mom, you need to learn how to do Zoom and you need to think about other things to do. So I started teaching and this year has been um, just a really wonderful year because I've met so many new people and I've also ha allowed my creativity to go in different directions. So pivoting 
can be a good thing, I've discovered. And so this year, um, I've been teaching a lot of the paper cutting. Uh, I've made a lot of the paper cut designs, as I said before, into templates that you can download and make at home. So people have sent me ideas, you know, could you do a Shema? Could you do something to do with a Hamsa? So if you, if you have an idea, send me your idea and um, look for it on the template page of, of my website. Um, I then also um, realized that people want things to do with their hands. Uh, just like I love to knit in my spare time, I thought it would be fun for people to make Judaic art in their spare time. So I came up with um, matzah covers and challah covers that you can paint or color in with fabric markers. And this has been really fun uh, to, to have on my website and make available. So the matzah covers are for Passover and the challah covers are for any time and they can be done by any age, adults, kids, anybody. And then finally, I've explored more the idea of licensing. I have 36 years of designs um, on my hard drives. So uh, one of the fun uh, licensing projects this year was that menorah you saw that was a wall hanging and then became Arc Doors was um, licensed by a puzzle company in England uh, and is now available as a wooden puzzle. These are things that pre-pandemic um, I might not have explored. So it's been a really interesting year, educational. Finally, one of the most fun classes we're going to do is coming up in March. Um, every year, uh, Passover is my husband and my favorite holiday. We do a lot of fun things for our family uh, for Passover. And after talking to Julie, it occurred to me, why don't I like put them into a class and share all these ideas with you? So this is my grandson last year. Um, we'll get to the frogs and we'll get to all the different plagues. We'll talk about some serious art you can do for Passover, uh, even some fun recipes you can do for Passover. Uh, I call it Art of the Seder, um, and that's coming up in, uh, in March. Uh, this is, again, the paper cut template you saw before is now available so that you can make your own who knows one Echad Mi Odea paper cut. You could use it um, as a frame piece of art, or you could put on the cover of your family's Haggadah. Um, or place cards, things like that. We're going to talk about all these different ideas um, at the class on March 8th. Uh, so I'm just going to share with you, like stream of consciousness, I'm going to share with you all my fun ideas um, about how to make your Seder more engaging, fun, and, and art that will last for generations. So I hope you'll tune in to some or all of those classes. So with that, I am going to turn off my screen sharing and uh, see if there are any questions. <laughs> um, there were a few. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, oh, I love seeing, okay, so um, let's see. Julie, if you could help me with the questions just because I'm... Definitely. Okay. Um, so someone asked how many hours a day do you work and how, what's the time frame between commission you know the the idea inception and when you complete the project so um i work a lot i i work um i don't work on shabbat but uh most every other day i work now pandemic year is very different but uh for the first <laughs> 35 years of my career um i'm, I'm really a workaholic um it it really depends on the project uh, a synagogue that wants a set of Torah covers um, in a normal year will contact me and I would say about three months later is when they can expect their Torah covers. But there are a lot of variables in there. The biggest one is getting the committee to agree and getting the committee to a final design. And that can take one meeting or it can take five meetings. So that's the biggest variable. I also find that my work has cycles and um, most synagogues want their everything uh, by the high holidays. So the summer is the time when I'm in my studio working the most hours and the winter is the time when I'm having the most meetings to decide on the designs. So it really varies on the project. Okay, there's some new questions also coming in. Um, so this is a, a was a business question. 
do you, uh, do they, is there a deposit? How does it work with the finances? So let me, let me uh, talk about the business for a second. So people think that I am just being creative all the time, that I'm in my studio making things, painting, dyeing silk. That is not the case. If you want to be a business person, you have to spend, I am guessing, about 40% of my, of my time on what I call the business of art. And that could be writing a contract. I have a, a very simple contract I've used for years, which asks for 30% deposit, 30% or 33%. Uh, the second third is due when I'm half done with the project. So everything's been okayed. I'm into making the items and I'm about halfway done. Then I ask for the second third. And then the final third of a, of a large project is due when the client receives the work. Um, so, it, it, but on a smaller project, it could, it could be 50% upfront and 50% when they receive the work. Um, I really believe in contracts. Um, in 36 years, I have had very, very, very few issues with customers. And I think that um, it's all about respect. I also think that if you want to be an art artist who's earning a living from it, you have to be a good listener. And you have to be able to work with other people and not always do the art you want to do. If somebody wants purple and I'm thinking it should be orange, I'm going to have to adapt. And um, if you don't like doing that, then commissioned art is not the right thing for you. Um, one person says uh, your, that your art is beautiful. They were referring to something, uh, a specific uh, piece of work, but I don't know which one. Um, where do you draw your stylistic inspiration from? So you can see that um, I have many different styles and uh, I would say the first is the customer. So when I'm working with a synagogue, the most important thing is they send me photographs of their interior. Uh, so I want it to go with their interior. Um, the Torah covers have to work with what's there in the building. Um, so that's the first inspiration. And the second is I am inclined toward beautiful colors. I try to go a little more neutral sometimes, but my personal inclination and I love bright colors. So if you, you know, all things being equal, you will see color in my work. But in the high holiday work, for instance, it's all whites and golds and silvers, which is also beautiful. I think the biggest thing about me personally is I like change. I like new and I like trying new things. And as we get into the different classes, you'll hear about different techniques I've tried because I just wanted to try something new. Um, so I think that's another thing you need to be willing to do if you're going to be an art professional is willing to try new things. So. Do you have anyone that works for you, uh, with you, any helpers in the studio? I don't have anyone in my studio. Um, my sister helps me with the new kits that I'm making. She's a great sewer, so she puts together the kits. Um, but uh, because we travel a lot and um, also don't love the pressure of having an employee, um, I work by myself. And it's great because then I can work at five in the morning or 10 at night, whatever I feel like. Um, someone comments that there's a visual motif um, that they noticed that runs through a lot of your work of um, running and dancing children. Can you talk about this? Motif? That is so true. So one of the first Katu boat I made, I don't know if they're on the class, but uh, my friends Carrie and Dan in New Haven, they were into Israeli dancing. And I, I took pictures of them doing Israeli dancing. And then I used that on their ketubah. Um, but they kind of looked more like children. And that uh, motif of the dancing paper cut children became sort of a signature. And I've used it so many times and I, I just love it. It's, uh, to me, it's the joy of Judaism um, and the joy I feel with my art. So um, they've continued to be a good representation of how I feel for 36 years.